and welcome back to the Constitutionals Podcast. I'm your host, Chad White. If you didn't know, this is the premier podcast for the website, cpleshcomedy.com. Like I just said, it's a website. Go there. Welcome back. 288. I'm petting the dog. You'll see him off camera, standing here, wearing his shock collar inside because he pissed me off and I have to teach him some manners. <laughs> Yesterday, I'm recording this several days late. Who cares? Not that many people listen to the show. <laughs> At this point, this is just a notch in the belt for the portfolio. <laughs> but yesterday, I wake up, I take him out, go downstairs, take him to the dog park. No one's down there. I take him to the dog park that's inside of my apartment complex. And for a second, for a split second, when I'm putting on his collar and everything, I go, I should put on the shot collar. I should e collar, e collar, call e collars now. They vibrate, they beep, they also shock. I went, I should put on the e-collar. I went, nah, he's going to be good today. This man has the most energy in the world. He's running around, eating up. There's a there's a central part where there's turf, and then there's an outer part where there's kind of, it's not wooded, it's just lots of trees, and dogs go back there and people don't pick up their dog poop. Meanwhile, I'm the bad guy because my dog wants to play with everyone's dogs and their golden retrievers or their doodles or their labs are so prissy and they don't want to play and I get treated like the pariah, which is why I have to take him down to the dog park at 7 o'clock in the morning. Anyway, he's eating poop back there and he's not listening to me. And I was thinking, God, if I just had the, if I had the e collar I could vibrate. Then he doesn't listen to me. I could put on level 3 shock. Then he doesn't listen to me. Put on level 5. But he'd listen to me at level five. They wouldn't be going higher than that. It goes 99. He's only gone to seven. Anyway, that's what I've been dealing with. (laughs) And also, I just woke up. I was like, I'm bored. I've been bored. I've been bored lately. Oh, let's do this. (laughs) This is meant to be an intro for... uh, 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 somebody I talked to. I talked to Ryan Hansen, actor extraordinaire Ryan Hansen. You may remember him from such... Spelled his name wrong. Well, let me change that in the title. You may remember him from such shows as Veronica Mars. And uh, what else would he be known for? Let's see. I'm going through his IMDb. Uh, he was on, he was on a show called Ryan Hansen solves crimes on television. I believe that was a YouTube show. Don't quote me on that because I don't remember if it was or not. I know it was a YouTube red show and I did watch that show. Correct. Uh, let's see. You've seen him in everything. You've seen him in a lot of stuff. I'll say one more thing. He was also on the Mindy project. There you go. Anyway, Ryan Hansen, he's a very funny guy. And uh, there will no be there, there will no be there will not be any video for this uh, for reasons that I do not want to get into. Why is that a thumbs down? Why did that happen? Anyway, so you'll be getting the exclusive audio interview for this. Uh, it's no one's fault. <laughs> it's just timing did not work out for a video. He's in a car, and the video is vertical, <laughs> and I just don't feel comfortable putting something like that out. So there you go. Because I think we talk about that in the show, in the in the interview. Anyway, he appeared on. Uh, but you know, I'm very happy I got to talk to him. He appeared on the second season of Night Court reboot, and uh, he's a, a new love interest for um, uh, Abby in the show. So. There you go. If you're wondering what happened to uh, uh, Pete Holmes, you missed the entire second half of this season. Or first half as well. Season. So, Anyway, I like Ryan Hansen. He's a very nice guy. Very funny. And, and, uh, and I, I, enjoy, I enjoyed his uh, stint on, on that show as well as everything he's done. I like Ryan Hansen. I'm a Ryan Hanshead. We're going to go with that. Uh, check it out. Here's the interview with Ryan Hansen, Night Court Season 2. It's all on Peacock. And uh, we'll be getting back to the regular episode after the break.
You're good. Did to you go. paint that, Chad? There's no way. That tiger. Well, Oh no no no! I found it in a uh, uh, the antique store. Sixty five dollars. Dude, it's so cool! No way! That thing's <laughs> sick. Yeah, I, I had to talk them down from seventy. Oh, you did it! <laughs> <laughs> how's it going? How's how's everything with you, Ryan? Good man, just hanging. Sorry, I'm in the car, but here we are. No worries. As long as you're not driving, uh, we'll we'll be safe. Okay. <laughs> I'm not driving. <laughs> oh no! <That's> my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ryan, uh, congratulations on this uh, on this role. I know, I know, it's not uh, you know, it's it's recurring, it's guest star, all that stuff. But I still think it's great to see someone uh, I know, not that I know personally, but that I know is a uh, uh, in in a role with a, a show that I enjoy. Yeah, thanks, dude. It's so cool to um, yeah. I was I was pumped to do the first episode. They asked me back. I was like, absolutely. It's the most fun cast. The live audience stuff is just a blast. You know, there's not that many of them anymore. So to, to be able to do it is, uh, I jumped at the opportunity for sure. Yeah. How How is it hearing laughs like almost immediately as soon as you tell a joke, as opposed to doing something that's single camera and then having to wait and see if that, what you did really delivered? Yeah, it's really, it's really a, a unique experience because you get immediate feedback, you know, from the audience. If they're not laughing at that thing or that joke, the way you said it, um, or maybe it's what you said. Um, they'll just give you an alt. They'll give you a new line. They'll rewrite the scene, you know, right there. Uh, and it's it's really cool. And then you do the alt and everyone laughs. You know, it's like, oh, that's that's crazy. That really works. So it's it's cool to have a, a live audience uh, in that aspect for sure. Yeah. Did you take anything away from John and Melissa as you had a chance to work with them? Uh, what was it like being with such two big le legendary comedy actors uh, in their own rights? Yeah, I mean, I was nervous jumping in, you know, because they're in their second season. Everyone's got their vibe going. They're in their own little boat. And, you know, some shows I've jumped on, it's a little harder to break through. They were all so cool and welcoming. Melissa is like, she made it feel like home. I mean, she really was like, she's so incredibly inclusive and funny and like, just makes you feel so comfortable that I got to do my best because she was so cool and made me feel so great about what I was doing and, and all that stuff. And, and John, same thing. He's just a legend and to be able to watch him work, you know, and when he turns it on, it's just incredible. Uh, he's just, it's so cool. So I, I really got to learn from, from watching both of them and getting to work with them. Yeah. It's, it's How amazing. was it? So a night court sequel series, did you ever watch the original show? Cause I, I like my journey with it was I worked at a, uh, a, a TV network here in Atlanta that was airing the second rights to it. And so I got a chance to watch everything uh, in broken order, but I, I saw pretty much every episode uh, in a reasonable amount of time, like two months. And it was fantastic. And that was like two or three years ago. How was this your first journey with Night Court or did you have a chance to watch it when it was on? Well, growing up, I wasn't allowed to watch it uh, because I grew up in a conservative uh, household. My parents, I, I think they, they watched it. They loved it. Um, so yeah, I caught it, uh, later, like Nick and Knight style, you know, I, I watched a few episodes here and there. I definitely haven't watched all of it, but, um, uh, Millie's calling. Okay. Um, so I, I, uh, huge fan, um, you know, later when it, when it was re-airing and then to be able to jump on and, and do like, I guess it's, is it a reboot? What is it? What is it called? Uh, I, anyway. yeah, a reboot sequel series. Yeah. Mostly. Yeah. yeah. It's so cool. Cause like, you're like, I watched. I, I was just, it's like all of the same sets and all that stuff. It's its very surreal to jump in there and be like, but now I'm on this show that I remember not being able to watch when I was a kid. It's cool. It's very, very cool. Yeah. What uh, did you, did you want to bring anything to the show? I know that obviously you can't do much as somebody who was just appearing on it, but did you want to bring something to the show, to the character in your own aspect and kind of just leave your mark? Yeah. I, I mean, no, nothing nothing crazy nothing i mean you know like i i wanted to well really the goal is to be invited back you know what i mean <laughs> so i just wanted to do a good job and do what they kind of like saw for this character and i just kind of bring my own flavor to it and um it seems like they liked it i get to come back you know i got to come back and, and i'm dating melissa's character you know but we're keeping it casual um and so you know just to do a good job and, and to be proud of myself and to feel like I did good is, is my goal, you know, um, nothing more. I mean, nothing, I can't really 
you know, because in multicam stuff, there's not really room for improv or any anything like that. It's pretty much set up joke. Like it's very you'll kind of ruin the flow of it if you kind of add your own shtick, you know. So I just wanted to do a good job, and I I think I did all right. Yeah, yeah, I I, I think so as well. <laughs> has has Thanks, there? Man. Well, for 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 uh, for this role, uh, I again, like you said, there's not there's not a lot of wiggle room for things. But uh, I know this isn't your first multicam role. And what was it like to step back into uh, this show, knowing that there wasn't as much weight on your shoulders as you as there were for other ones where you were the main person who had to take on that leadership type deal? Yeah, it's cool. It's um, you get to relax a little more, like have a little more fun with it. Like, yeah, like you said, the pressure is not really there. It's not your show. Um, but you don't want to be the guy that's like, oh, that episode is great, but that one guy, you know, yeah. so you don't want to do that. Um, but uh, it, it's uh, it's it's cool being able to to kind of see everyone, especially they're in their second season and they got their vibe going, and to see how everyone works and to kind of just kind of jump in like double Dutch style and see if you can keep up you know it's it's pretty fun yeah yeah the, what about the the schedule I, I know the schedule is very tight for multicams did that uh work for you do you enjoy like having something that is just so regimented as opposed to doing something that's single camera where you have to shoot at night you have to shoot uh all over here to shoot over there did, did that really help you out in in your in your acting style Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, on a single camera, you could be on any lo any location, however far away, you know, um, with this, it's at Warner Brothers, it's down the street. Um, most of the days I can still pick up my kids from school. Uh, the, the, the schedule for multicam is incredible, especially if you got a little family or whatever. So I was happy to do it. And it's just kind of a bummer. There's not as many uh, multicams anymore. But um, the ones that that uh, uh, are good, like this one, it's just incredible to be a part of. And the schedule is, yeah, it's killer. It's the best. What 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 were you doing uh, in between your scenes? Were you were you picking over at Crafty? What's your favorite Crafty snack? What, what are you getting over there? I'll tell you right now. It's and I can do it at home, and I don't know why I don't do it. But if you slice the apples like long ways, and yeah. they're kind of not too thin, and then you the peanut butter and then granola, and you make a sandwich, and so it's like an apple peanut butter granola sandwich and they have them at crafty all the time and they are my favorite i love them so much and then when i'm not at crafty which is where i'm usually uh i'll, I'll either watch um, the scenes that i'm not in and, and laugh along with the crew or i'll be playing my switch i'll be playing zelda baby tears of the kingdom even though i beat it i still play it i love it i was i was actually playing it last night uh and i am so far behind i'm just I it's it's great though. I, I got it for my birthday for my sister, so I, I have to hop back into it. I just like to take my time because oh, me too. Who knows we're gonna yes. get another big Zelda game like this where I can go to three different levels of the earth. Oh, it's so cool. I know it'll be another five years till we get one, but it's the coolest game. Take your enjoy. Take your okay. time. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, Ryan, I got one more for you. Uh okay. You've you you've been you've been doing comedy, you've been doing dramedies, uh, and and again, this is a multicam. How are you as a as an actor who uh, is is taking care of their lines, looking at the the pages that they get, and uh, even though again this is recurring uh, guest star, all that stuff. How how do you approach uh, your acting style with uh, your remembering the lines and doing the lines and performing the jokes in ways that you see fit and the ways that the the writers and directors and producers uh, work with them too. So I really like to go over my stuff and at least the night before, like, and really kind of get it down, down, you know, like all that stuff um, and be really prepared on set and then be able to play with it about, you know, once you know it really well, then you can kind of play with it. That's, that's what I like. So to do multicam, it's very interesting. It changes every night and the pages will come in sometimes at like one in the morning or like the next morning. So it really took a lot for me. It takes a lot for me when I do a multicam or a show like this, uh, to kind of let it go and to know that I'm not going to know my lines the day before I'm, I'm I, it's going to be fine. Um, and to just kind of trust myself and trust my instincts about, um, getting them that morning and, and knowing that everyone's on the same, everyone else is on the same, in the same boat, you know, like not, not like somebody else is getting the lines before or whatever. Everyone's kind of getting the fresh lines that day. Um, and then just being, and, and so that creates like a, like a, like a looseness, which I'm not really used to, but it, it's great. So to kind of like, on the fly, learn your lines, and here we go. I don't know if that made any sense, Chad. 
Yeah, I did. That's perfect. Uh, you gave me you <laughs> okay, gave me a yeah. great answer, and uh, in in fact, I'm going to use it as a pull quote for this interview. Uh, hey, <laughs> Ryan, thank you so much. I appreciate it. This is, uh, this is fantastic. I think you're a very funny guy, and you do an awesome job, whatever you whatever you're in. So this is a this is a dream come true. Thanks, buddy. You're so cool, and congrats on that tiger saving five bucks. <laughs> you rule. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Have a good day. All right, see you, buddy. Thanks. Bye. And we're back. Welcome back to. Uh, um, the Constitutionals podcast. All right. We've got enough squabbling about. I know that means fighting. Let's get on with the episode. This comes from Variety, written by Todd Spangler. YouTube's Dude Perfect scores $100 million plus investment as it plans New Texas HQ as family-friendly entertainment destination. These guys are quickly trying to create, not quickly, they're trying to create their own Disneyland, their own Universal, in the heart of Texas, and and you know what? More power to them, uh, dude. Perfect. If you don't know, they're YouTubers who are from I would say the early days, uh, the the mid early days of YouTube, where they were creating trick shots. You know, riding down a hill uh, on a sled. Uh, in the middle of summer heat, and and there's a basketball goal at the end of the hill, and they're and they're launching a basketball or a football or whatever, uh, seventy yards, and it hits the backboard and it goes in or it swishes, uh, and it's uh, I mean it swishes the net, and I, I mean it's amazing. I uh, I uh, I think they they are very nice guys and they're just well meaning. Uh, it is also very funny to <laughs> to like watch their video. Sometimes watch their videos sometimes, and then like they they play music in the background of these videos, uh, and they are religious guys. They're they're religious guys, and um, and sometimes you'll like see you'll see a video, and then like you'll hear the music is like and work with him in the name of the Lord. It's just like very funny to hear like this rock music that's like Christian tone. Anyway, they are bringing in. As I mentioned, 100 million dollars in growth capital from private investment firm Highmount Capital, which is what they're going to use to help build their uh, giant production facility slash entertainment park over there in Frisco, Texas. This was announced more than a year ago, and they're describing it as a combination production facility and family-friendly entertainment destination, comprising a retail store and new spaces for podcasts and gaming. So it seems like they're going. It's going to be like, you know, a Paramount Studio, or a Disney Studio, but you're also going to be able to go there, take tours, and and see stuff, and and do a 330-foot trick shot tower. Uh, see a Dude Perfect Museum, a mini golf course, and some restaurants. They're going to do an international tour. They've got a streaming app coming up, and they've got a 30 for 30 documentary that's going to premiere April 25th at the Dallas International Film Festival. And I do That makes sense that they have a 30 for 30 documentary. I love 30 for 30. I think it's such a smart idea that they went past the original 30. <laughs> I like it. They've been uh, posting their trick shot videos since 2009. I was correct. I said early, I said mid early, mid early YouTube because early YouTube is 2005. They've ge- uh, generated more than 17 point. I was going to say generated. <laughs> they generated more than 17 point uh, 17 billion views and uh, garnered more than 60 million subs. The the dude perfect team is ha- also has a faith based mission. Uh, quote: We're giving back. We're about giving back, spreading joy, and glorifying Jesus. Uh, that their website says. This is a no-brainer for them. They're, I mean, they're one of, I, I can't name any other YouTube channel that is as successful in the same way. I would probably say someone along the lines of Doug DeMiro because he's he's able to start Cars and Bids, which is a car auctioning site uh, that you can sell your car on or you can buy a car from. Uh, but I can't, I can't think of any other YouTube channels, oh, Mr. Beast, obviously, that do the same or able to generate the same kind of not in the same scale necessarily, but the, that, that kind of wealth and then also turn it into a successful business on the outside. Um, well, you know uh, who has prime Jake Paul. Uh, I don't like that guy, but uh, prime kind of 
to me. I it blew up because <laughs> I didn't know about it until January of this year when I saw it on store shelves at Target. I'm thinking, what's Prime? And then I then I see Prime on this like literally just bottles on the street, <laughs> just empty bottles, you know, after festivals or something. I'm thinking, wow, people just really love this stuff. And then uh, I think South Park did, and their latest special on Paramount Plus, they did. They had some Prime things in there, so yeah. Anyway, but this is this makes sense. They've they had uh, Dude Perfect has been truly all over the place. I mean, they've had a Nickelodeon show. They're they've 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 they have apps, and they've got a great name, Dude Perfect. What else have they had? Let's see. Uh, the group was selected by the Harlem Globetrotters to play in their annual player draft in 2015. They had a CMT show as well. Oh, this, oh the, D, the Dude Perfect show is that one show. Okay, never mind. I thought they had more. They had a documentary on uh, YouTube Originals. They released a song. And they have all the world records in the world. So, there you go. Thumbs up. (laughs) Next up, CBS News goes 24-7. This comes from Variety, written by Brian Steinberg. Uh, My fridge just turned on. CBS News plans streaming overhaul with new Whip Around program. CBS News is... uh, is, Oh, that's a dryer. I was like, wait, what's all this noise going on? CBS News is this uh, amalgamous term or title for all of the all of the CBS broadcasters' um, uh, uh, coverage of news events. Same thing like ABC News, ABC News. They all have their own uh, uh, coverage. I was going to mention Fox. I was like, wait, Fox News is the thing. <laughs> Fox Broadcasting doesn't have a news channel. It's Fox News. Anyway. And uh, for for these past couple of years, CBS News has had I don't because I, I I really did not pay attention prior to the to the streaming revolution. But CBS News and NBC News and ABC News have streaming channels that you can find for CBS News on Pluto on um, YouTube wherever twenty four seven streaming channels that uh, and then for NBC same thing on Peacock whatever and ABC I don't know where you find that, but they they more or less they play the same stories that are on their parent programs. So if it's if something happened on NBC Nightly News, if a story was airing on there, then, you know, in a couple of hours, you're probably going to see it on uh, NBC News's Peacock NBC News channel <laughs> or wherever they have this channel. You can probably find it on the NBC News app or whatever. Roku. <laughs> Just one word, Roku. But because we're in the streaming, this now the streaming world where, you know, CNN and Fox News and MSNBC, yes, they can be, they have been 24 hours for the past couple of years, but they're stuck on these uh, 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 cable platforms. And you see CNN, uh, Warner, trying to break out of that by including CNN Max on HBO Max. I'm going to keep calling it that. They tried that before with the CNN uh, live app. I don't know. the I forgot what it was. CNN Plus. CNN Plus app. And obviously that didn't work, but then they smartly released it on Max, which is where it should have been the entire time. Um, and uh, and then you see Peacock you know, invest in uh, having NBC News have its own big – kind of explosion for uh for peacock wherein that you can watch if you subscribe to the highest tier of peacock you can watch the today show live on peacock you can watch uh exclusives of nbc news stuff live there and also um i don't know they still do this but they did have some shows uh nbc news shows that were made specifically for peacock and this is before the big turn into TikTok and everything. I don't know if they still do do those shows, but anyway. So now you have Paramount, who was in the middle of being bought by maybe Skydance, uh, go in on CBS News. And they kind of had to at this point because not many places have a news channel and you either double down or you start letting people go. 
and they have this they have CBS News they have mornings they have uh, CBS mornings they have uh, the CBS nightly news program which is not what it's called CBS evenings I guess I don't know so they kind they they need to focus on this because this is one of their tent poles for television CBS news CBS broadcasting and then the primetime stuff which I'm including late night in which is technically not primetime or whatever so now CBS News is being renamed and is being overhauled. They've got CBS News 24-7. It's going to rely on journalists from both the national news outlet as well as from local CBS stations and serve as the new name of the broadband outlet. John Dickerson is going to get uh, 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 more help. There are going to be more shows. And he's going to, John Dickerson is the lead anchor, and he's going to be able to help kind of lead that section of CBS News. They have a CBS News Washington uh, Bureau, and it's going to launch a 1 a.m. program called CBS News Roundup for late night viewing. I don't know who that's for. The move represents some of the most significant from uh, the uh, president and CEO of a unit that compromises CBS News local station syndication, uh, Wendy McMahon, Mahan. She was given sole oversight of CBS News, the company stations, and its syndication business in August of last year. And this is just, this is the first big step that she's taken since then. She is one of a group of business executives who have been handed the reins of news operations at traditional media companies, which are testing new strategies for reliable newscasts in an era when viewers are dispersing to a panoply of new streaming options. So why are they doing this? They want to be able to, especially with that 1 a.m. show, touch on a, a new audience. A lot of this is going to be geared towards uh, people who are, well, I mean, we're all on our phones, but it's going to be geared towards people who uh, rely on watching news broadcasts and how and how they get their news. So you're going to see it on TikTok, you're going to see it on Instagram, you're going to see it on YouTube, I, I assume. You're going to see a big push on the Paramount Plus app. You're going to... Uh, uh, See, you're going to see a lot of streaming efforts really come from this. And you're going to see a lot of, I'm, I, what I'm guessing is because they they're, they have the local stuff too, you're going to see a lot of cross-pollination. So maybe you'll see some, I mean, I've we, we've seen, we see this all the time. You're going to see some uh, uh, CBS Sunday morning, CBS News Sunday morning show, uh, excuse me, story be teased on the Thursday episode of CBS mornings. You're going to see, uh, some nightly, so the nightly show, you're going to see that be uh, teased on uh, a Sunday show. You're going to see stories pop up everywhere and be played and replayed. And this is pivotal because we are in the middle of an election year and people are going to start choosing not only sides for who are they, who they're going to vote for, but they're going to start choosing right now where they're going to get their news from. And if CBS can be one of those hours or one of the, excuse me one of those platforms for you, then they're going to take it. Executives see the new whip around format, which takes viewers to whatever seems most pressing or important as the backbone of the service. The concept has already proven popular in sports where the NFL Red Zone cable network takes subscribers from one interesting play to the next across the league on any given uh, in Sunday, in-season Sunday. NBC recently unveiled plans to use a whip-around concept as a backbone of its Olympic coverage and its Peacock streaming hub and a new Gold Zone program hosted by, in part by Red Zone anchor Scott Hansen. So basically, you're gonna if if there are six stories happening in a day, like today is again this is late. <laughs> today is the 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 start of the jury selection for Trump's uh, civil trial in New York. So you're gonna have uh, if there's if, if even a little monochrome of news happens there, like oh if they've chosen the first juror, then you're gonna you're gonna see that's gonna be the lead story. And then if there's another uh, uh, earthquake in New York, you're gonna see that. They're going to hop over that. 
it's ba- I mean, whip around is just a fancy term for it. they're going to be going back and forth between different types of stories. They're going to introduce new shows like America Decides, a weekday look at Washington news and politics. That's going to launch April 22nd. You're going to see uh, an expansion of John Dickerson's uh, primetime newscast that's going to go to 90 minutes from an hour. I don't know if we need to need that. And that's going to be renamed to The Daily Report with John Dickerson. I like it. I mean, uh, you know, we just the more sources for news we have out there, especially on television, uh, it's is very important. And, I, and it seems like it's a dying medium, but this is, you know, I mean, it's the same reason why SNL or Key and Peele or any other sketch series that's on television, they don't just make things for online. They don't make it for YouTube. They they broadcast it. Because there's money in that, and there's also a chance to have more eyes, and it can and it can spread and go viral and things like that. They need they, them at CBS News and NBC News to an extension, and ABC News having focusing in on television instead of just trying to lean in on TikTok is great because they still you're, there's still people who watch television. They can they can reach a streaming audience, and they can also have the online. They can do all that stuff in one. It's fantastic. All right. Next up, NPR is accused of bias by one of its journalists, and not one single person is happy by this journalist. This comes from the New York Times, written by Benjamin Mullen and Katie Robinson. Yuri Berliner, who's a senior business editor who worked at NPR for 25 years, wrote an essay that was published by the Free Press last week, uh, which is part of a Substack publication uh, and wrote that quote people at every level of NPR have comfortably coalesced around the progressive worldview and if yeah I don't read <laughs> okay I'm not gonna say don't read this uh, check out his piece it's very uh, center right and uh, he he's essentially saying that NPR has chosen a side when they're supposed to be objective and it is uh, and and that they're that they're going downhill and spiraling downhill um, uh, and he's, he's also said the internal culture at NPR had placed race and identity as quote paramount in nearly every aspect of the workplace. I mean, dude, you, you sound like a relic of your own, of your own time. And it is unfortunate that you think that way, that, uh, that you, that you think that NPR has become this left-leaning uh, 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 bastion for, uh, uh, for 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 people who 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 are just uh, who hate you know Republicans, which is not the case. I mean, ev- everything, every podcast I listen to from NPR, every story I, re- I read is in such a middle of the lane gray area that I sometimes I I can't I think that. That people uh, uh, that I once thought were left or right, or that I once thought were right or left, and vice versa, and vice versa. The essay ignited a firestorm of criticism of NPR and social media, especially among conservatives who have long accused the network of political bias for it on its reporting. NPR has forcibly pushed back on Berliner's accusations and criticism, and people that work in NPR are are very uh, angry that he's still working there for some reason. Some other NPR journalists also criticized the essay publicly, including Eric Deggins, uh, its TV critic, who faulted Berliner for not giving NPR an opportunity to comment on the piece. In an interview on Thursday, Berliner expressed no regrets about publishing the essay, saying he loved NPR and hoped to make it better by airing criticisms that have gone unheeded by leaders for years. He called NPR a, quote, national trust that people rely on for fair reporting and su- superb storytelling. Uh, you know, if when you write when you write a piece that is very accusatory like that and you don't reach out to the company for comment, you are... You were at at fault for, for basically uh, uh, falling into the same accusations that you're putting out there. It it doesn't it doesn't make uh, any sense when you are having a one sided argument or conversation 
uh, and you're not giving them to a chance to speak up or like having a dialogue in a, in a space where you really need it. Because right now you're just pointing fingers. You know what happens when you point one finger, four pointing back at you, three pointing back at you. Whose thumb is pointing back like this? When the hosts of NPR's biggest shows convened on Wednesday afternoon for a long scheduled meet and greet with the network's chief executive, new chief executive, Catherine Meyer, Maher, Maher, conversations, it's M A H E R. <laughs> My baloney has a first name, it's M A H E R. <laughs> conversations soon turned to Mr. Berliner's essay, according to two people with knowledge of the meeting. During lunch, Ms. Chapin, uh, uh, who is the uh, uh, who works at NPR in some way? Hold on, let me see. Who is the organization's editor in chief? <laughs> Told the host that she didn't want Mr. Berliner to become quote a martyr. The people said. Okay. Anyway, I mean it's it's the same thing that happens when somebody says CNN is. Is uh, uh is is lean leans left or or something along those lines, um it's, you know I I heard I I heard uh, some uh, a, a political person last week or a talking head whatever talk about how let let me go along with CNN let me go along with CNN the how they said uh, that CNN had put on a jersey and they chosen a side and that was, uh and that was you know uh, leaning left and and in this world of we're blaming everything on not blaming everything, but we're, we're again, like doing a story against Trump means that you're against Republicans as a whole, which is not the case. There's, there's things that, that you talk about in the, in the political parties, uh, that are, that are, you know, it's like, Oh, the, like the, the left wants abortion and, and women's rights. And then the right doesn't want abortion. They don't want women, women's rights. Those are things you, you, you know, you go back and forth about, but then when it comes to something like Trump, uh, uh, the, those views are so radical and so off putting and wrong and hurtful to a, to a lot of people, uh, uh, that, that you say anything against it or for it, then you're the best person, in, you know, not I don't, whatever, but you get the point. And uh, NPR, for what it's worth, has not chosen any type of jersey. They have not chosen a side. Uh, and as, I mean, in the same case, I, you know, I'm coming from CNN. I've, I did not see any side choosing over there. They just did stories. If they, they did a lot of anti, not anti-Trump stuff. They just cover a lot of uh, Trump coverage. So in the same vein, just because they cover a lot of Trump things doesn't mean that they're necessarily anti-Trump because there's a lot of people that uh, not a lot there's uh, several people that they are correspondents at CNN that worked with Trump Alyssa Farah Griffin they had uh, uh, Adam Kinzinger they like just um, uh, the Scaramouche you know all those people have worked with him and and they are by all means still conservatives they're still Republicans they're still getting paid to appear over there they're just anti-Trump everybody's anti-Trump and uh, so that so that goes for NPR just because they're doing anti-Trump stories or they're doing stories about race or gender or whatever. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily choosing a side. They're just reporting on what's important at the moment in time. That's why podcasts like Code Switch or the um, what is the NPR Latino podcast? Uh, uh, Alt Latino. You know, Radio Ambulante. That's why these shows exist because they need coverage and they need representation. So this guy is only looking at NPR as a whole and he's saying, oh, they're doing stories about sex and gender and race and it's too much. Well, that's what needs to be covered. Anyway, there's a whole messy way of saying that this guy's wrong and stupid. All right, this final story comes from the New York Times, written by James Paniwazik. Why are people obsessed with TV finales, quote-unquote, sticking the landing? Curb Your Enthusiasm ended last week after, what, 20 years, 25 years, 24 years on air? And uh, 12 years, 24 years, uh, 24 seasons, uh, excuse me, 12 seasons, 24 years, 
and uh, and you know what? For for what it's worth, we know Larry's never going to learn a lesson. We know that uh, he's always going to say something insane, or not insane. He's going to say something that is on our minds, but uh, uh, but we agree with, and he's going to be that vocal piece. That character is going to be that vocal piece, and and the show ended with. He and his friends on a plane all arguing with each other about a very mundane thing like Susie uh, opening the shade on a plane <laughs> so she can get some light to read a book. Anyway, the 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 finale of the show, I'm going to go ahead and ruin it. It's been a week. If you wanted to see it, you would have seen it by now. The finale of the show ended, and it was very much foreshadowing this from episode one, uh, that Larry was going to go to jail because of something he did in Georgia in regards to a, uh, uh, a voting law where he gave a friend a bottle of water. You're not allowed to do that. It's a real law. And he gets in trouble. He gets arrested. And all season long, he's got to deal with this. And then it, it quickly, people put together, you know, in episode one, oh, he's going to go to jail, and it's going to mirror the Seinfeld finale, the infamous Seinfeld finale, where all four characters went to jail and they, uh, and that's how the show ended. So they like in the finale, they do this. They do this courtroom scenes. Uh, these courtroom scenes, rather, and uh, some characters come back. They don't have everybody come back. It'd have been great if they like. It's the it's strange how they chose like three characters, and like two from this season. <laughs> but anyway, some some people came. Some uh, some characters came back, and then he ends up going to jail. And the episode with four minutes left is. Like they're they're dollying backwards, and and Larry and it, and it references back to the first episode talking about pants tent, and and then uh, out of the blue Seinfeld comes up and is like, hey, you're getting out of jail because uh, because of this stupid thing, and then they turn to each other, he and Larry uh, turn to each other and go, we should have done this for the Seinfeld finale, which is which yes, it's poking fun at that thing that people hate, but also for this show. To end on a plane with Larry arguing with the main character of the show and Ted Danson. I don't know why Ted Danson was there. <laughs> but for, for Larry to... I know why he was there, but he's not really a main character. Uh, but for them to be arguing with each other, that is that is the ending. Like, that is the ending of the show. And the same goes for other shows like Cheers. You're speaking of Danson. Or MASH. Just because they had great, excellent finales doesn't mean that Every show has to have the same tie it up in a bow finale. Like, look at Cheers. Cheers ended with, uh, 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 you know, Ted. I, I'm genuinely forgetting the names. <laughs> Ted uh, running away and leaving the bar and uh, and going with Shelley Long because they've they're going to try love again. And they're they're sitting on the plane. They go, this isn't going to work out. And then he returns to the bar and he has his last conversation with Norm, and he turns off the lights. And, you know, the next day they're all going to come back and do, you know, another day at Cheers. Uh, uh, what else? What else? Friends. Friends ended with um, everybody going their separate ways, more or less. You know, Chandler and Monica move away and uh, move out of the apartment. And and and, uh, and Rachel and uh, 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 Ross are going to try again. And, and Joey's. You know, the spinoff counts. Joey moves to California, and Phoebe uh, has uh, uh, Paul Rudd. Mike, I think that's his name. So not everything has to have these giant, you know, neatly packed endings. People don't like the ending of The Office. People don't like the ending of Lost. <clears throat> Lost. But it all happens. You know, this is what this is what they came up with. At the at the perfect time for themselves, and I know I've not referenced J, uh, Mr. Uh, Pony uh, uh piece, but this is more or less capturing what's going on. What's what he's writing about? The Mad Men finale was great. He writes about that. How about your mother? I think How about your mother had a good fine finale. Oh, the, the fine a fine final season. He writes, when serial stories end badly, however, it's usually the result of wrong turns taken much earlier that no immaculate kicker can redeem, as with the forced push toward a predetermined conclusion that ruined the last season or so of How I Met Your Mother, ditto for reasons, uh, for different reasons, Game of Thrones. And I think they were fine. 
If anything, Game of Thrones is more rushed than How I Met Your Mother. Also, How I Met Your Mother, the entire last season takes place over three days. Come on. I think that's really fun. He writes, my bigger problem with sticking the landing is what it implies about what matters in art. That an artist's highest concern should uh, be not to make a mistake. That narrative art is a story problem that builds toward a a correct solution. That the ending of a work determines its final score. That there is a score and that the score is calculated through a running tally of credits and deductions. That it is linear, that is math. See also the sportsmanlike obsession with some fans with uh, Rotten Tomato percentages. I mean, that's that's very true. Sometimes endings stink, like uh, the Dexter finale, which I know people hated. But you're not taking it as a whole. You're not seeing the enjoyment that the entire story was telling you. Go back to How I Met Your Mother. We spent nine seasons with these characters, and yes, there were ups and downs. There was uh, 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 Barney dating uh, uh, Robin, I just, which I, th- I just hate in her, in her group dating. Uh, there, there is, there is uh, Ted dating Quinn. Is that her name? Oh my God! Is, I, hold on. How I Met Your Mother, Quinn. Is that her name? Yeah, Quinn sucked. Ugh. No wait, Quinn was a. Uh, no, 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 no. Hold on. That's that's not the one I'm talking about. Who is the one? Ted uh, dates um, the uh, the activist. Oh God, I can't remember her name. That's how much I hate her. Zoe. Oh, Zoe sucked. Zoe stunk. Quinn was great. Quinn was the one that Barney should have married. It should have been Quinn or Nora. Anyway, I mean, yes, there are, there are parts we hate, but it's the ending is not the totality of everything. And, and and regardless of how a show ends, you're going to remember it not for the ending. You're going to remember it for the time you spent with it. All right, listen. If you like what you heard here, head to the website, cpluscomedy.com, where you've got uh, me interviewing some people. Uh, Ryan Hansen, of course, I just talked to. Uh, I just talked to uh, India de Beaufort, Lacreta, and uh, Nyambi Nyambi. Uh, for Night Court as well. I also talked to Jesse David Fox and Eddie Schmidt for uh, uh, The Good One, which is the Mike Birbiglia um, Peacock documentary. So check out all of those, cpluscomedy.com. You can watch video versions of two of those interviews <laughs> on youtube.com slash cpluscomedy. You can see a video version of this podcast there as well. You can also subscribe, see video versions of other podcasts, including The Constitutionals Podcast, and uh, uh, which is the Entertainment Business News Podcast. Oh, wait, this is that. Uh, late Night Lately, which is the Late Late Night Show show, uh, and uh, LinkedIn Logs, which is the Jobs Podcast. You can follow us on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at C Plus Comedy. Follow me at Chad Black White. Subscribe to those other shows wherever you get your podcasts. And that is it. I thought the spiel would cover the rest of, of this intro part. But it's not. Okay. I'll see you later. Bye.